Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Simona Mihaita. I'm a transportation researcher from Data61, uh, now a new entity of CSIRO, for those of you who know about it already, the former NICTA, National ICT of Australia. And today we are holding the session Roles of Data Analytics and Transportation Modeling for Fast Changing Urban Infrastructure. Uh, we had the idea of proposing this special interest session simply because even us, like uh, the advanced data analytics and transportation team, have dealt with a lot of problems when it comes to using big data in our transportation projects. So with the occasion of the ITS World Congress, we really wanted to invite speakers from all around the world. And you will see today we have uh, a lot of speakers coming from US, coming from Malaysia, uh, from Australia, uh, some uh, even from our team, who will share our um, insights, our lessons, and our uh, challenges that we have to face. Before starting the session, I would just like to remind all speakers to put their phones on silent, please. And you can use um, the application of the Congress at any time to check the schedules and the order of the speakers. And uh, they said that all the presentations and the videos of the sessions will be available very soon for everyone to, uh, to like just download and save. Um, I will do a short introduction for each of the speakers. And our first speaker is Aditya Menon. He's, uh, a member of our team. Aditya is a researcher in the machine learning group here in Data61. He has completed his PhD in computer science from the University of California, San Diego, under Charles Elkin in 2013. He is broadly interested in the design and analysis of machine learning algorithms for supervised learning problems occurring in practice, especially those in novel problem domains. He is specifically interested in applications of learning methods for traffic analytics and he has worked on prediction of traffic flows following changes to road network topology and the statistical estimation of OD flows. Please, Aditya. Thank you, Simona, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Thanks for making it back after lunch. So like Simona said, so my training is in machine learning. So it's very interesting for me to come and get a first-hand glimpse at what's going on in an actual application domain, which is of interest to me. Uh, so the work I'm presenting today is very much the culmination of effort of, of the advanced data analytics and transport team. And so uh, quite a number of members are at the uh, Congress. So I would encourage people to drop by. Uh, we actually also have a booth, which you might be interested in having a look at. Um, so the title of this presentation had two components. So both of them are probably familiar to everyone here, just to set the tone of this presentation. Uh, the first one was data analytics. Uh, if it's probably not possible to really summarize this in a single slide, but if I had to take uh, an attempt, um, it, for the purposes of this presentation, what I'm talking about is uh, you have, you have uh, lots of uh, different views of some particular uh, domain, right? So very commonly referred to under the, the broad brush of big data, right? Uh, you, you pass that data through some uh, algorithmic uh, you know, machinery, right? So typically called nowadays machine learning, could sometimes called data mining, you know, maybe going back a little bit uh, to statistical processing. Uh, and then from that, uh, you know, the result of those algorithms, hopefully we get some insight about whatever original problem we had. Okay, so, so that's, that's a methodology right, or a procedure. Uh, there's a problem, which is going to be the focus of this presentation. That's incident management, probably familiar to everyone here. Um, so you have something anomalous or unplanned happening in, let's say, a road network. And um, you know, you'd obviously like to be able to detect this as soon as possible. <laughs> And once you've detected it, want to figure out how bad uh, this particular anomalous uh, event is going to be. So we have a, a procedure. We have a problem. We can combine the two, clearly. Uh, is it worthwhile to combine the two? So I think so. So for at least a couple of reasons. So firstly, the problem itself we know really isn't going away. Just as an example, if you look at congestion in, in, just in roads, uh, in, in a big city, that's really not going to be uh, you know, completely alleviated, just in the short term at least. 
Um, so the problem of, let's say, having incidents occurring from congestion, that, that's, that's still going to be present. Um, and on the other hand, uh, you know, the, the data available to make sense of these incidents, so let's say to detect incidents, to figure out how severe they are, we're going to get more and more data you know, as time goes along. So kind of trying to find out manually, trying to find patterns in this data, maybe is not the most scalable approach. So there, there, there seems to be some value in looking for automated approaches to making sense uh, of the data. So uh, what I want to present today, uh, you know, just give three little vignettes, which uh, hopefully illustrate some examples of how one might use uh, data analytics for three kind of specific problems to do with incident management broadly. Um, so the first of these is the problem of just detecting whether an incident is occurring, uh, let's say, in, in our road network. Uh, and so we'll, uh, I'll present kind of two different views of how one might uh, you know, detect these incidents. The first is maybe a little more topical. And so this is just based on the observation that uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, in, uh, these days, um, incidents, we, we can find out about incidents happening you know, fairly quickly just by looking at uh, you know, uh, what people tweet about. Um, so people here could be a news organization, it could be an actual road authority, it could be actual citizens who are just making their daily commute and noticing something unusual in, in, the, no in the road. Um, and so, so if, if we go through uh, you know, Twitter uh, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, in uh, semi-real time, we might see information about, let's say, incidents occurring in Sydney or Melbourne. Um, the question is whether we can, again, find an automated procedure that can reliably figure out you know, some information from this uh, big pool of data. Um, and so uh, just at a very high level, um, uh, so we've developed this system called Traffic Watch. Um, and so here the basic workflow is going to be that we have tweets, which are you know, tweets are a priori could be about absolutely anything. It doesn't have to be restricted to Australia. It doesn't have to be restricted to road networks. So we have this big pool of tweets. So from this, so firstly, you want to filter out to figure out which tweets are actually relevant to, let's say, uh, incidents on roads. And then you maybe want to do a little <coughs> bit more analytics to, to make, again, some sense about you know, what, what underlying patterns are there maybe in these incidents that you've detected. And then from that, maybe get some idea about, you know, in real time where incidents are occurring in your network and give some notion of confidence. Uh, just, just wonder, so I, I don't have the time to go into the details of any of these. Happy to talk in uh, more offline, but just to give a flavor of, you know, what actual data analytics might go into, um, you know, a problem like this. Uh, so one, one problem would be, for example, okay, so you've determined that a, a tweet, uh, you know, is, is some, saying something relevant about, um, an incident, let's say in Sydney or Melbourne. Uh, so can you figure out you know, from this tweet, which is a you know, pretty cryptic short piece of text, can you figure out uh, what, street, what the street name is? Can you figure out what the type of incident is? Can you figure out how severe the incident is? You know, intuitively as humans, so we, we, we can find certain keywords, we might come up with some automated rules that could do a pretty decent job. But uh, the, the point of, for, of following a data analytics approach is that we want an automated procedure that can maybe Know, find these things reliably once we've trained some model uh, on historical data. Right, so based on some trained model, automatically figure out that boundary street that refers to a road name and big pile up means that the incident is severe, for example. Okay. Um, another thing we might do is, so we, okay, so let's say we found out that there are certain incidents occurring in the Melbourne or Sydney CBD, but can we cluster them together to figure out, uh, let's say, um, you know, get more confidence about, okay, if it's just one person happen, happens to tweet about something, maybe that we're not so confident that something actually happened. If we get 10 tweets that are all roughly in the same vicinity or roughly using the same words, we might have a little bit more confidence that this is a real event and not just something spurious, okay? Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, I, I, like I said, I don't have the time to kind of demo this, it's a, although it's pretty cool. Uh, I would advise people or encourage people to come over to the booth to have, just to have a play with uh, you know, this, this system. Um, so, uh, and just as an example, so this system, um, so I guess one of the, the benefits of doing this again is that once you've put the effort of automatically training this model, um, you, 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 can, you can then just deploy it and then for example, if people are tweeting about something, which is maybe a minor, relatively minor incident, like a, like a lane closure or, or just like a tree is falling down, um, you, you might be able to detect this incident early on compared to you know, just more <coughs> conventional sources. Okay, 
So this is, like I said, a little more topical in terms of, okay, we're, we're using this fairly, you know, fairly new medium for detecting incidents. Um, a more, I guess, tried and true method, which maybe is more intuitive uh, in some cases. It's okay, let's just look at the actual, uh, you know, observations of, of the network. Let's look at, let's say, uh, flows or travel times or, or, or what have you. And um, let's figure out, let's say, a normal state behavior for how a particular link behaves or maybe how a group of links behave. Uh, and then from that, just determine if we are seeing something that deviates from that behavior in, in whatever uh, observations we're getting in real time. Um, and so again, here, a very, very high level, we have as input, let's say, the, the, let's, as an example, the flows from an entire network, right? So this, these big time series. We want to crunch that through some machinery. And so in this case, uh, something we've had some success with is uh, techniques from uh, deep learning. Um, and uh, you know, from that, again, figure out a, a normal state behavior for each of the links, for each of actually the group of links, and then determine if something just deviates uh, kind of from that. Uh, again, so this is something you can uh, have a play with uh, in, in the demonstration in the booth. Um, but uh, I must press on to the other two little uh, examples. Uh, the next one is on congestion propagation. So here, let's say we, we've detected, or maybe someone has told us that an incident has happened. And we'd like to know, know, okay, so what's the impact of this incident on the network? Um, more specifically, let's say that we know an incident has happened on some particular road segment, and we'd like to have some sense of which uh, surrounding uh, road segments are gonna be affected as a result. Okay, so which surrounding segments, let's say in 15 minutes and 30 minutes are, are likely to get congested as a result. Um, the, again, at very high level, the, the picture should start looking familiar. So you have the data as input. So in this case, let's say flows or travel times from this big network. Um, you crunch that through some machinery, and then from that you're getting the insight, which in this case might be some uh, historical patterns that you've observed as to you know, uh, frequent uh, propagations of congestion in the network. Uh, again, just to give a very, very high level overview of what uh, this machinery might look like. Uh, so something we've had uh, some success with are tools from graph mining. And so in particular, uh, we use a notion of frequent uh, uh, graph mining. And so uh, essentially what we try and do is say, okay, so we observe, let's say, uh, sequences of segments being congested in the network through time. Uh, so can we kind of, uh, can, can we kind of try and link them together to, to find, okay, so this segment A got congested at time one, then as a result, segment B got congested and at time two. As a result, maybe segment C and D got congested at time three, and so on. So can we piece that together? Uh, sounds, sounds pretty simple. You might expect this sort of thing can blow up if you do it naively. So again, th there's some machinery involved to, to just do this in an automated and an efficient fashion. Okay, uh, just a simple example here. Um, so this is an example in the uh, Melbourne, um, uh, just in the Melbourne network. So here's an example where uh, the, the model detects that, for example, at 440, there's a particular recurrent congestion that's happening around the Olympic Park area. And at 445, uh, that congestion is very frequently associated with the congestion uh, at this segment B, which is you know, just uh, the one um, upstream that that's just uh, connected to that, um, and which at 505 kind of spills back to a, a further number of segments. And so again, so you can not only produce these trees, again, in an efficient manner from historical data, you're able to associate, for example, confidences, how likely do you think any particular tree is <coughs> compared to others? Okay. Um, the very last uh, little uh, example is on the more, okay, stepping a little bit back. So let's not worry about figuring out in real time what's happening with incidents or not. Uh, let, let's just take a, a broader view of you know, the historical behavior and just try and say something a little more abstract about just inherent safety. And so uh, in particular, uh, let's say we have historical uh, records of you know, where incidents have happened or not in, in some particular region. And you know, from that, let's try and derive some notion of a risk profile of a region. Let's say the risk profile of a suburb, okay? Uh, so we can obviously do that fairly simply just for if we're given the incidence uh, occurrences themselves. Can we maybe, for example, relate that to certain exogenous factors? Can we relate that to the weather at the time? Um, can we relate that to the demographics? I don't know, just a number of exogenous factors that maybe explain each of the um, regions of interest. Okay. Um, the picture by now, I think, should be fairly familiar. So you have data, right? So lots of, of data, which so obviously you have data about the incidents themselves. That's one dimension. Then you have all these, this data about these exogenous features that you're interested in modeling. Right? So maybe the demographics of a particular region, 
maybe information about the climate at various points in time when those incidents occur. So that's the input. You crunch it through some machinery and you get the output, which is maybe a risk profile. So for each region, let's say each suburb, your belief as to you know, how likely it is that, you know, let's say, uh, how accident prone that particular suburb is. And again, linking that back to those exogenous factors that you plugged in. Um, and again, so, so what's the secret sauce? So what's this machinery uh, in this particular case? So in this case, we've had some luck with tools from spatial statistics and point processes. So these are things that have had lots of applications uh, in, in different domains like ecology and finance. And so the basic idea is you, you're trying to model directly the intensity of some particular event. In this case, just the, 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 the inherent probability of, um, let's say, an accident happening in some particular uh, region of interest. And again, you're able to relate that back to whatever exogenous factors you decide are uh, potentially relevant to, to predicting uh, that riskiness. Okay, um, so th that was a, probably a, a very uh, a high level summary. So like I said, be happy to talk more about the details of any of these uh, offline. Um, and so uh, again, I think the main point is, so th there is scope for using uh, data analytics in a, a number of different uh, problems related to incident management. And so sh I've shown you know, three particular examples. Uh, clearly there, there's obviously potential to even go beyond incident management more broadly to other problems in transportation. Uh, if we're being even more ambitious, I think, um, I think we should be, uh, you know, just more broadly the problem of designing smart cities, right? So just going beyond, uh, let's say, road networks and more broadly in the infrastructure in general. Um, but maybe that's a topic for another day. And so for today, I think I might stop there. And thanks. Thank you very much, Anitya. Uh, if there are any questions from... The room. Yes, um, please. Yes. Do you want me to use that? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Pam from Curious. Um, we're looking at similar types of use cases around being able to identify incidents. Have you actually built those algorithms and have you turned it into a tool that's being used? So the uh, traffic watch, so this is actually a system that's been uh, implemented. And so you can come by maybe later and have a look at what's going on with that. Uh, so some of the other stuff is more on the research prototype side of things. So for example, um, the, the anomaly detection. So we, we do have a demo again uh, with the, in the booth, uh, but this hasn't been, I guess, fleshed out to the extent that it's, I guess, a working system that we've been able to deploy. So but, you've yeah. done a few early tests and we're, we're about to testing it and how, what have the results been so far? Uh, so, uh, so uh, the uh, for the anomaly detection. So for the the second uh, approach, so the approach that's using, let's say, the auto encoders and uh, neural networks, um, results have been uh, fairly good. So what we so without getting too technical, uh, essentially we're able to find that we it's able to figure out uh, very uh, succinct representations of let's say each of the segments that represents their let's say normal state. And then from that, very reliably, so in terms of false positive and false negative rate, um, you know, detect uh, you know incidents that, that we've uh, yeah that we kind of have, have tested against, but uh, yeah, maybe not quite at the level of uh, of, of commercial system just yet. Now, yeah. if you want, so our Data sixty one boot is the three one one eight. It's near the Singapore stand. Uh, we present a real time analytics demo. And in that uh, demo, we have the traffic watch integrated, real-time monitoring of incidents from uh, Twitter, and we also have the anomaly detection as Aditya presented in that demo. So feel free to stop by, talk directly, see how it's working, and yeah, share your experience. Thank you, thank you, Aditya. Our second speaker for today, uh, Dr. Carlos Idos, is stuck in traffic. Uh, he just called us. Oh, all right, perfect. <laughs> Didn't see you, I'm sorry. So yes, we will stick to the plan then. Um, um, a short introduction. So Dr. Carlos Idos uh, received his master's and PhD degrees in computer science and computer engineering from the University of New South Wales in 2006 and 2012. Currently, he is a principal systems analyst at the Roads and Maritime Services in Sydney. In this position, he researches and develops algorithmic solutions for intelligent transportation systems, in particular, traffic signal control systems and traffic data analytics. 
He focuses on traffic simulation-based development, whereby the development outcomes can be immediately verified. His main interests are on artificial intelligence, more specifically machine learning, applied to time series analysis, statistical data fusion, online traffic simulation, RAM metering, and adaptive traffic signal control. And previously, he used to develop, simulate, and test drive embedded software and algorithms for automotive powertrain control system. So welcome, Thanks. and we're looking forward. Thank you. And Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about four different things. There are four different use cases, I'd say, on um, how we use traffic simulation or traffic modeling for um, verify or evaluate changes that we have done or changes that we plan to do to um, the traffic systems that we develop. Um, so um, one of them is going to be talk about, talking about uh, simulation motorway um, uh, active traffic management systems. Um, in the loop simulation <coughs> testing of traffic systems, SCATS in environment study, and SCATS congestion management. These are all the four uses cases I was talking about. So the first one is um, trying to highlight the importance uh, of the close connection we have on our systems to modeling. Um, this is a picture of the Holland Tunnel connecting New, New Jersey to New York. Several years ago, we had an issue here where the tunnel towards the New York side has a slight upgrade, creating a bottleneck. Um, at the time, the free flow capacity was about 24 vehicles per lane per minute. And when congested started, it came down to 19 vehicles per minute at the congested during congestion. So, what they've done, they put a, a movable barrier at the entrance of the tunnel. Now, I'm using a traffic signal here because I couldn't find a movable barrier in Visio, so excuse me for that. <laughs> but you get the idea, right? So, now the way the movable barrier worked was it would close every minute, and then, so it would open every minute, allow about 24 vehicles through, 22 vehicles through, and then would close. It would cl remain closed for about 10 seconds, and then it would open again. So it will allow one platoon of 22 vehicles per minute per lane through the boom gate. Now, the result was that it managed to recover from 19 back to 22 by actually stopping cars at the entrance, okay? So the reason it's doing that, it's actually creating a gap and interrupting the shock waves propagating from the bottleneck. And that was enough to actually resolve the bottleneck. So this is some of the outcomes they had. So this was the traffic flow before the control, before the boom gate went in, or the movable barrier went in, and this was the traffic flow they had after. So you can see clearly higher values of traffic flow after the boom gate was deployed. Now, um, this was done in 1960, okay? Um, they already understood back then that you have to stop traffic to get more traffic through, if that makes any sense. Um, so just to give you an idea of what that could potentially mean in terms of queuing and delay, um, I built a hypothetical scenario with before being now highlighted in red in this slide and after being highlighted in blue. If we had a one hour of demand of 25 vehicles per minute per lane, one vehicle more than the free flow capacity, which was 24, we actually get a queue of 360 vehicles without the movable barrier, and only 180 vehicles with the movable barrier. If that, after that one hour, we completely terminate the demand, again, just for the sake of an example, it would take another 19 minutes without the movable barrier, or only eight minutes with the movable barrier to clear that queue. Average vehicle queuing time would go from nine minutes to four minutes for every vehicle. So this is a travel time reduction 50% by actually stopping cars at the entrance of the tunnel. It makes no sense at all, right? But the data shows it did. So, now, we have all other types of bottlenecks in our motorways. 
we have bottlenecks. The most common bottlenecks we have on our motorways are merge, on-ramp merges. Um, so this here is some data we collected from the M4 motorway in Sydney. And this is a time diagram of the afternoon peak period. The red line there shows you the speed on those detectors just before the merge. So imagine traffic is flowing down here. There is a merge from an on-ramp. There are loop detectors there. This is notionally where the bottleneck is. And the speeds of those detectors are actually represented there. So this is basically telling me, whoops. Excuse me. Excuse me. So this is basically telling us what time congestion started and what time congestion ended. So now if we have a look at the flow that got through here, is this blue line. And you can see that there, that once congestion started, the flow that is getting through is reducing. Okay? This is what we now call the capacity drop. This is what the movable barrier in that Holland Tunnel experiment saw. That once the turbulence is created, the turbulence itself, in itself makes the bottleneck less efficient and the capacity actually drops. So this was in one direction. We checked in the other direction, same thing. Um, a different uh, time of the day, same thing again. So obviously capacity drop is not a new thing. This is something people know to exist when congestion starts for a long time. Um, so we then went to try to model that area. And then we found out in where modeling, we actually couldn't get easily the tool to simulate the capacity drop. You can see that the speed is actually dropping, congestion starts, but somehow the car following model, the lane choice model, some are, is too efficient in a way, if you can say that, um, and cannot clearly represent. And this, again, I did some, some searching around on this, and it turns out that it's a very common, um, a common challenge for several modelers that try to uh, reproduce this phenomenon in microsimulation in general. So we decided to um, try to understand um, how could we use microsimulation to show the benefits of rent metering or any other active traffic management center if we can't model the most important behavior that we're trying to solve in simulation. Um, so rate metering, you would have the same issue. So just to give you an example of what the problem with uh, not having the capacity drop of rate metering. So a, a basic problem, imagine we have a motorway, two lanes, and we have a demand of 3,500 vehicles an hour coming in, a bottleneck of 4,000 vehicles an hour, and a demand on the on ramp. Excuse me? Yep, sorry. So, um, thanks for that. Um, so, the, we have a demand of 3,500 vehicles coming in here on the motorway upstream. We've got a 500 vehicles an hour demand coming from the on-ramp. And we've got a 4,000 um, capacity, a notional capacity here. Okay? So, basically, this example looks balanced that whatever's coming in can get out. Okay? Now, as soon as we get an increase of 500 to 700, for example, we would typically have the capacity drop of what I'm estimating here about 10%, and you get a queue, right? Typical behavior that you get on a motorway. And in one hour, you would get a queue for about 600 vehicles with these numbers. The average queuing time of every vehicle in there will be about five minutes. Now let's say we try to use rent metering to solve the problem. So the demand will increase there, but because if we have rent metering, we can actually keep that demand reaching the motorway to 500. So we get now a queue here instead of there. And the queue will be 200 vehicles. The average queue in time will be 1.5 minutes. So that's what rent metering does. It reduces a delay time of five minutes in this example to a delay time of only one and a half minutes. Obviously, it changes who actually waits, but overall, the waiting time is smaller. 
Now, what if we try to do this in micro simulation without capacity drop? Once we increase the demand to 700 and we don't have RAMI trained, we still keep the 4,000 there because we can't show 3,600. We can't model that. We get a queue of about 200 vehicles only instead of 600. And the waiting time is 1.5 minutes. So what is the result? In the field, without RAM metering, the waiting time, queuing time is 5 minutes. With RAM metering in the field, is 1.5 minutes. But without RAM metering in <coughs> micro simulation, it's also 1.5 minutes. So that means in simulation, we're only shifting traffic from one side in the other, but we're not producing and showing an overall net benefit. So when I started um, developing RAM metering systems, and I started to see that we couldn't um, show net, you know, an overall net benefit, I said, why the hell are we doing this? It doesn't really help. But this is when we decided everyone in the, 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 the systems we have deployed in the field clearly show the benefit in the field. But in simulation, we just could not show that. But we decided to um, find out how, why is that we can't show that easily in simulation? So there's a few theories of why the capacity drop happens because, you know, honestly, no one knows. And some of them have to do with resignation. Once you, as a motorist, once you got into the congestion, you resign and you become a less efficient driver. So when, the queue, when there's a small gaps in congestion or when you get to reach the end of the queue, you don't accelerate as responsively as you probably would um, after being exposed to congestion for a short period of time. The headway relaxation is when someone changes lane in front of you, um, you, change, you tend to overcompensate by slowing down much further than you normally would under congested situations. Then there's the asymmetric acceleration, deceleration theory, which is you, are, you start accelerating l more aggressively and decelerating, sorry, accelerating less aggressively and decelerating more aggressively once you've been exposed to congestion for a certain number of time. Um, and then there's also the regressive behavior. So these are only theories of why people's behaviors and motorists potentially cause the capacity drop. So we thought that resignation was a simple one to explain. Um, and um, we actually um, started to write some plugins in the microsimulation to see if we could actually change it. Um, and then we managed to reproduce the capacity drop to a way that, in a way that we could make it reproducible. Um, the other, and then we had also a very positive uh, outcome of that because we started to liaise with our friends from TSS, which um, took this on board and started now a, um, uh, an effort to try to make this part, intrinsic part of, 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 of the tool uh, for modelers that require this, um, um, this particular feature. Um, so this was the first topic I want to talk about, probably the longest one. Don't be scared. I'm not going to be here for a long time. Uh, the other thing is in the loop simulation testing uh, of traffic systems. This is basically how, for example, we test our systems. We have RAM metering, a RAM metering system here. Um, We've got a, um, normally the roadside infrastructure where we got like volume and occupancy or loop data in general coming from the roadside to the system and then we have the traffic signal times going back to the road and our systems we can sort of replace that with a micro simulator and simulate the systems just in the same way and with the same configuration we use in the field. And that allows us to make some nice comparisons before we actually make changes to the software. So for example, this is here, a particular parameter of the software showing with two different versions of the software running identical scenarios. So the system is completely reproducible. So we can actually understand exactly what changes will be um, reflected to the field deployment uh, and allows us, for, allows us to do all sorts of nice um, inf inf inferences about what changed, find bugs and all sorts of things. Um, the other thing is uh, the sketch in the environment study. Um, several years ago, uh, something that came out of the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen um, was a study on scats on how it actually was 
reducing our emissions and saving all of us, um, well, as a community, uh, travel time. So what we did was <clears throat> uh, we selected a particular SCATS installation in Sydney. Uh, it's a, an arterial road for about 20, with about 27 um, intersections. And we spent quite a significant amount of time trying to build a model that reflected that as best as we could. Um, something that we knew was going to be defensible and, and well calibrated. Um, so for whole, those who are a bit familiar with Sydney, this is Military Road that comes all the way from North Sydney where the Sydney Harbour Bridge goes to the city up to the northern beaches. Um, and um, in this way, we also needed to... Com so one of the challenges we had was how do we actually now compare the benefits of the SCATS? Because SCATS was deployed you know, decades ago. Eh? So how do we actually have the network without SCATS or something simpler? So it turns out SCATS has different modes of operation. One of them is what many of us, or many of the SCATS predictions will call FlexiLink, which is a traffic actuator time of day plan. And this is what we use the, uh, as our base case or contrary scenario. And this is what we use now as the full adaptive SCATS master link mode. So we're actually comparing SCATS against SCATS, but we're actually using a lesser mode of operation that is used when communications are not as, as avail uh, not available. Basically comparing the adaptiveness against the fixed time. Um, so that is the fully adaptive SCATS, which optimizes and all the trades off. And this is the traffic, traffic actuated time of day based system. Now, that was the savings we had estimated on city metropolitan area. Per year. So uh, $3.8 billion every year, it was what we estimated the SCATS benefits to be against a traffic actuated fixed time system, time of, sorry, traffic actuated time of day based system. So these were the benefits for the corridor, and then we did some extrapolation into the whole metropolitan area. So this, to us, was very valuable understanding for many of our business cases from now on. Um, and um, it's also very helpful to understand the value because this is the type of question that we get asked from managers the whole time is how much are we actually improving traffic? Um, since the system being there for so long, we didn't have anything to compare with. And modeling is a fantastic tool to allow us to do that. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just going to skip through it. So this is just my last slide. So I'm just going to show you this. This is another scenario where we use micro-simulation tools to test a variety of different parameters in the system, in SCAS. So we can see that it's very easy to stuff things up and not so easy to make things better. So we can see how many different scenarios we try to improve. And you don't, don't need really many scenarios to start things really bad. Again, thanks to simulation modeling, allows to do these really nice things on experiments with different parameters to try to make everyone's um, travel experience better. Thank you. Time is very, very short. If we have only like quick question that you would like to address to Dr. Idols. I have just a very small question. Mm -hmm. Like um, the lack of observing the capacity so on in the micro simulation happened with only one micro, micro simulation tool, or you just like tested various we, others? We, and we tested with three different tools oh, and right. we observed that on consistently all across all of them, yeah. Thank you so much. Let's uh, move on to our third speaker, Dr. Alexander Torday, which I invite here. 
A short introduction. So, um, Alexandra holds a master's degree in civil engineering and uh, the PhD in ITS applications. Both are from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. After spending some years in academia, he joined TSS, Transport Simulation System, in 2005 and has since worked on several simulation based uh, projects with a focus on pushing the boundaries of established modeling technologies. Alexander is a partner and consulting director at TSS. He is also a member of the Swiss National Expert Group on Intelligent Transport System and the International Standards Organization. Thank you. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. I will try to, to catch up a bit on, on time if we can. Um, so basically, the, this, this presentation is about basically merging both. Uh, so we have been discussing about analytics in the first presentation a lot of simulation on the second one. The idea here is really to discuss about how we can combine both uh, for predictive system. Um, so basically, let's try to see if this video is playing. It was playing. It should play, maybe. Oops. Let's see if I can do that. Otherwise, we'll just keep it. OK, that's fine. Was working on the speaker room, but not here. That's fine. I would just, yeah, yeah. I don't think we have time for more. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, so basically, the idea was just like in, in 30 seconds was to explain you the, the idea of a decision support system. So basically, I will summarize the video. The idea is basically when, you, <clears throat> when you're able to, to read in real time uh, the information you receive in a control center. The idea is to use uh, traffic simulation to simulate faster than real time. So basically you are uh, able to uh, evaluate what is the current situation, replicate this into a simulation model, and then if you have an incidence, what you would do is to run the simulation way faster than real time. Like for example, a one hour horizon prediction, you will maybe take two minutes to simulate that. So you will simulate the impact of the incidents, and then you will simulate in parallel computers a lot of different scenarios that you want to compare. Uh, as uh, Carlos was saying, the simulation will provide you the ability to uh, take out a lot of different KPIs, different indicators of performance, and then you will be able to compare these different scenarios and see which one uh, is providing you uh, uh, the best results in terms of what you are trying to achieve with your traffic management uh, strategies. So uh, basically the, the product with, we are developing, I'm just showing you here uh, the, the global architecture so that we can understand uh, the different needs. So um, Amazon Line, which is the, 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 the decision support system based on simulation, is on the gray box. Uh, you can see on the top that basically the main feed is, is real-time uh, flow detection. So the flow detection is mainly there uh, in order to be able to understand at any time what is the level of demand on the network. So how many people are trying to move for, uh, 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 in the network. So we are analyzing the last half an hour or one hour tendency of the different uh, loop detectors. And then basically this is an input to do what we call a pattern matching. So we're looking at some uh, comparison with some historical data that have been pre-processed into the system trying to see which pattern is the closest to what we are observing. And then we will have corresponding origin destination matrices for people familiar to modeling. This is the number of people that wants to move from A to B in the network that we're modeling. And this origin destination matrix is representing the demand side of the simulation. On the bottom sides, we fit the system with the current situation of real time, uh, traffic signals, even strategies that are fed into the system that represent the, the, the supply side. And these forecasting data are, are computed and, and sent to the operators. Also, we will compute some uh, quality manager indicators to uh, evaluate the quality of the prediction. So very quickly, a couple of examples. One is uh, San Diego. Here it's a project that funded by the Federal Highway Administration in the US a 50 uh, kilometers uh, corridor on the north of San Diego. Um, you can see here the complexity of the system integrations. We have data coming from a lot of different uh, providers, different formats, different uh, languages, different quality. So obviously, uh, this is a lot of work to be able to integrate these into a data hub and to pass all this information to the traffic simulation. Um, the San Diego example had the particularity that it was the first time we also used uh, um, analytical prediction to complement the simulation one. 
And I think that's the most interesting slide of the presentation, if I have to be uh, already uh, at the two minutes level. So that's, that's the slide that is uh, showing. Um, so here in the middle, you can see this is what we call the real-time simulation subsystem. This is the one that takes the, the real-time context that is loaded into the simulation, take the different response plans we want to compare, and provide some uh, measure of effectiveness back to the data hub. So that's the classical approach. But on top of that, what we had is an, ad an additional simulation that is running permanently. Uh, every five minutes, we do a, a one-hour prediction in a rolling horizon basis that uh, is mixing analytical prediction and simulation here. So how does it work? So for the simulation, the problem you have is that you have to load into the system the future origin destination matrices. So if you are at 8 a.m. and you want to simulate one hour in advance, you have to be able to evaluate what will be the demand from 8 to 9, let's say in pieces of 15 minutes of origin destination matrices. So obviously you can take the patterns, the historical patterns, that you have uh, pre-processed with historical data, but it's way better if we can, comp we can just extrapolate the tendency that we have on all the different detectors based on analytical prediction and use these fictitious predicted flows that we have on this detector to adjust the different uh, matrices that are used in the simulation. So that's how we have been able to combine both techniques in one. And this one is uh, providing what we do, uh, a map of volume of capacity of the entire network that is the main input for the business rule engine that is computing the different strategies that will then arrive into the simulation system. So you can see here that this is the main exchange of data and this is how we take data, put back data, and so on at different levels. So this was the first time we, we were able to combine these two and it proven to be very efficient. Um, this is just quickly a view of what the operators see here in San Diego. The system is in place for more than two years now and, and maintained where you can see the different strategies and how they are comparing. You have here the score uh, on the top. Uh, moving forward for a question of time, the second implementation will be in Lyon in France. This is a project that is ongoing. It, it's just now uh, implemented in their control center. This is the size of the type of simulation. This is uh, way more urban compared to the San Diego one. Uh, pretty complex uh, in terms of uh, uh, the number of intersections that are simulated in this model. Um, so in this case, what was very interesting is that when we did the uh, analytical um, and, 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 and statistical analysis of the data, is that what we do for every city is to analyze how many different patterns could uh, easily represent the 365 days uh, of traffic that you have in, in, a, in a city. Interestingly, in most of the cities, we will need at least 10 or 15 different pattern of demand to represent any type of days. While in Lyon, we have found that uh, it was way more stable than other cities in that with only five to seven patterns, we were able to represent most of the traffic that have been analyzed uh, uh, there. Um, and then, so you, you can see here all the, all the, the clustering process and how we, we group together some of the detections and create uh, global patterns that will be used both for the OD matcher and to support the analytical prediction system. Um, this is the dashboard uh, that you can see uh, on a web-based uh, uh, user interface in which you can check what I was mentioning before, the quality manager indicators. The idea is basically if you are predicting half an hour in, in the future, half an hour later you will have the real data that you have been trying to, to, to forecast with this combination of analytic and simulation. So we're providing scores. Uh, every city and every implementation have different ways to score, but the idea is the same, is how good have we been doing with, with that. So um, I will finish with this one in Lyon. So here you have all the, the way of explaining how the, the quality manager indicators have been computed. But what I think is very interesting here is to see over one specific day how the quality have been, have been going. So uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, have already always the prediction of a 75. This is our quality threshold. Um, because the system has been just put in place, uh, we haven't reached this all the time. So sometimes we have some quality drops uh, that you can see here, uh, especially around the AM and the PM peak, which are the most sensitive uh, in terms of uh, uh, variability because we're close or over capacity. And one thing that is interesting here is that you can see here that both the analytical, analytical prediction and the simulation uh, are uh, reasonably wrong. Uh, 
so you just like five, five points below the threshold of, of acceptance. But there is a clear correlation between the analytic and the simulation. So there must be something related to the way we are treating the data because both are fully affected in terms of performance. While something interesting is that on the EM of the same day, the analytic is performing well while the simulation is dropping. So this, this case, we can see that this is a problem that must be specific to the simulation. Maybe a phenomena that is not uh, correctly uh, perceived by simulation while the analytic is, is doing pretty well. So that's just a, a very interesting ex uh, example to see uh, how the two different uh, models are performing in a, in a specific uh, uh, applications. And uh, basically, we're trying to improve in the, in the future application. We have some uh, new online that will be applied to other cities. Is uh, We continue to uh, uh, improve the combination of these two models because we have heard too much about well, is simulation better than analytical? Should, which one should we use? We continue to believe that the best is, is a combination of both. And that's it. And if you want some more information about this solution, uh, this is the boost number. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, you're right in time. Perfect. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? So now we'll be even more right in time. Yes, I, I would have one little question. Um, so how much data do we need to have a good prediction? Like, um, do we need like one month, one year, three years? Um, so, so the difference is, so you, you have, if you look just for a typical work day, uh, typical Tuesday or whatever, even sometimes six months of data are sufficient. The, the main problem is when you have uh, some specific yearly events, like, for example, the main conference, uh, the, the, the Australian Open in, in Melbourne, these happen only once a year. Yeah. So for this one, you will need to go two or three years back in, in, in the past, but not for typical days, I would say. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um... Let's move to our fourth speaker. Oh, let me just find. My mouse is not working. I would like to invite um, Mr. Josh Johnson, which is the director of the Intelligent System Department at the Southwest Research Institute in USA. He oversees R&D in the domains of transportation systems, cybersecurity, space flight software, high reliability systems, analytics, and decision support systems. He received his Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from the Missouri University of Science and Technology in 1999. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Josh Johnson from Southwest Research Institute uh, in San Antonio, Texas. I want to start by recognizing um, the main contributors to this research, David and Adam. They are uh, uh, the talented engineers that did this work. Uh, I'm more of a PowerPoint engineer specialist. <laughs> all right. Uh, what I want to cover today, I think all of us can relate to being professional traffic engineers and armchair um, or uh, hobbyist traffic engineers at 5 o'clock every day when we leave home to go f um, uh, leave work to go home. Um, based upon the day of the week, the time of the day that you leave, leaving at 4.30 versus 5.30 obviously has a big impact, and we've studied those kind of impacts for a long time, but um, you also probably know whether or not school's in session, whether there's a major football event or some other special event in the city later in the evening, that would have an impact on your travel time. Um, if it's raining, that would have a significant impact. Um, maybe uh, something as odd and unique as the alignment of the sun with the roadway geometry during sunset would have an impact. So there's all these other types of events that occur um, in the environment that have an impact on predicting traffic and what normal traffic really is uh, beyond day of week, time of day type information. The big advantage, if we can have our systems do this type of prediction, uh, all of a sudden we know when there's something abnormal happening. So uh, if we know what the real normal is for everything that we can control um, has a cause-effect relationship in the environment, we know if something's wrong, we can uh, dispatch, uh, uh, look, look at that traffic uh, in that area more closely um, and see if that's an accident. 
potentially can save a lot of money in your operations environment from maybe going five or six staff members in an operations environment to maybe two or three or even less someday. Um, so I think this is amazing technology to take advantage of in our industry. Um, we, we did a study where we grabbed two years of data. Uh, so the speed data, uh, or the traffic data was speed, volume, and occupancy, as well as vehicle length. We'll come back to that and why that might be important. Uh, and then we took event data, which included traffic accidents, uh, debris on the roadway, uh, construction information as well, so pre-planned events, uh, as well as some of those other things I mentioned that you know have an impact, like weather, um, holidays, the school calendar, and other sporting events to plug into the, uh, uh, the analysis model. So we did our analysis with a set of data in Orlando, Florida. So if you ever visit Disney World, um, this is actually north of the city. So the tourism is not as much of an impact here as it would be um, south of downtown Orlando down into um, International Drive and, and where Disney World is actually located. Um, at the traffic data and specific, some of the challenges and things that make it uh, uh, non-trivial, um, we, we got both raw data files and average data out of the database. Uh, there were different intervals which the, the, the data was collected depending upon the sensor type. Um, so it was as frequent as 30, uh, every 30 seconds or uh, every five minutes, and then it would be rolled up and averaged as well. And it was lane level data in most regions and some, and some uh, other regions it was segment level data. For the event data, uh, we uh, looked at uh, both uh, the final state of accidents, but also had access to uh, the event records like uh, the accident was identified, the emergency response is now on scene, the response has um, uh, been cleared, but the queue still remains. So that kind of information was available in the event data, uh, which was valuable. Um, and we also tracked um, primary accidents versus secondary accidents, um, had uh, uh, records from service patrol drivers and vehicles, um, so those, those counted a lot of uh, uh, stranded motorists and debris on the roadway and that kind of information as well to plug into the model. Uh, next, looking at weather data, um, this was uh, a, a very challenging. There was a lot of different data available, but the quality of that data from a historical per perspective uh, was pretty lacking. Uh, we settled on using airport data um, that gave some more regionality to the data as opposed to being uh, broad like county or state level or city level type data. Uh, there are several airports in the Orlando region. Um, there are challenges with getting data on a 24-hour basis. Typically the data was only published when the airports were open. Uh, fortunately that coincided with most of the time when there were traffic type issues. Um, there's a lot of variables in that weather or in that airport data. Uh, we did have to to make a temporal and spatial association with the airport with, with the roadway segments. Um, and so at, some, at different times, different roadway segments were associated with different airports based on whether or not the data was available at that time. Uh, looking at other data, so we mentioned day of week, day of year, those are very important factors uh, that coincide with uh, working schedules, but we also looked at um, holidays and whether school is in, se in session. I jokingly put moon phase up here. I think there's a uh, data analysts uh, have this uh, uh, some sort of strange interest in, in whether or not moon phase has an impact on uh, having heart attacks, um, occurrences of werewolves, um, or admittance to um, uh, a psychological institution. Um, so yeah, there was no association with traffic. But I mentioned earlier, sun, the sun, does have an impact during rush hours when sunsets and sunrises align with roadway geometry. Um, so that's uh, just an interesting tangent. Uh, we'd also looked at sporting events. Uh, it was really easy to find sporting event data uh, for current, um, uh, current events, but it was not necessarily easy to find past events, um, surprising or not. Um, so that's, uh, that's something to start keeping track of. So data cleansing was a significant challenge in the process. And I'll come back to this at the end and mention this again, but we probably spent 30 or 40% of our time in this research actually uh, performing the data cleansing. So any of the raw sensor data that you get, there's going to be problems with sensors going on and offline. You're going to have missing data. Um, we had to transition at different times from a 30-second interval to a five-minute uh, interval. We did find at the end that uh, five to 15-minute data granularity was sufficient for this type of modeling. Um, I mentioned the inconsistent, uh, the, the uh, uh, vehicle length uh, being something that we looked at a little bit. Um, so that actually is a, uh, uh, a predictor of how much, or indicator of how much um, commercial truck um, 
of uh, vehicles were in the mix of the traffic at that time. So uh, we had uh, trucks that would be uh, reported as, our vehicle links reported as 100 feet long, obviously that there are not uh, 30 meter long uh, trucks driving down the roadway. Uh, so there were issues with that and dependability with that. So data quality again and data cleansing uh, was a big, a big challenge. Uh, this is an example here of a, uh, uh, a detector uh, that uh, instantaneously one day reported, started reporting a 10 times increase uh, in the volume. There was some maintenance done uh, and it was improperly configured. And so these algorithms would really have a hard time dealing with that. Uh, visualization uh, became very key in this process. It became this iterative uh, work of uh, trying to build these causal relationships uh, and determining what routes and what algorithms were effective. Um, it makes you appreciate the human brain and what it's capable of doing. Um, and the visualizations allowed the researchers to look at it and draw conclusions and pick what tangent to go down next um, as they progress through trying different algorithms and approaches uh, and also identifying uh, the missing data and data quality issues as well. So one of the analysts that worked on this was not a transportation researcher by background, and he actually made the comment to me, hey, I understand why managed lanes are being a promoted approach to manage traffic, because at a certain point, if you have too much uh, traffic volume in entering uh, a segment, uh, it has an impact on occupancy and speed. So if you can control the volume, then you can maximize your traffic throughput. Only if the rest of the public use such an analytical approach to uh, um, uh, determining their opinion on the things we try to do to make their lives actually better. Um, the, uh, the actual analytics approach, I'm not going to deep, deep dive into this. Uh, we used an ARIMA model in the end. Uh, this has been done for a long time. Um, I've, there's papers back to the uh, late 1990s, uh, 2000s. Uh, when this was uh, done for some modeling, uh, but with a limited set of data. This is speed and volume focused. Um, it does very good uh, with time series data, uh, but it does have some, some downfall. So uh, additional approaches, um, at, so this is a little more detail about the actual ARIMA model that was selected in the end. After that, we move to uh, more modern approaches um, to analytics. So uh, we're using uh, partitioning around metoids, uh, trying to identify the best curve fit. And after curve fitting was done, then we would actually look at uh, removing of outliers to find the, the, uh, the best pr prediction of an unperturbed day uh, where we isolated out all these other factors that I've been talking about. Um, some of the challenges we had um, in um, finalizing this model and the, and the analysis, um, events um, are not necessarily associated directly with a detector location. So the detectors are typically somewhere between a third of a mile or a kilometer to about uh, 1.5 kilometers um, in distance from each other. So we had to do some uh, uh, spatial association in the data. Um, and those events obviously have an uh, uh, impact upstream and downstream um, in the data as well as their impact on, on, on traffic speed. Uh, weather um, is probably the next big adv advancement as far as a data source I don't think we typically take advantage of in our, in our traffic prediction. Um, almost any event that occurred during uh, non-peak times that there was a traffic slowdown could typically be associated with weather. Orlando is kind of an interesting place if you've ever been there, uh, between the time of year. Um, there's almost every afternoon, there's uh, thunderstorms that roll through, uh, and it can be sunny in one location, and a few kilometers uh, over, there can be a pretty torrential uh, downpour. So uh, the, uh, uh, the specificity of the weather data you have available to you um, is going to make a big difference. I think connected vehicles are going to be a big advance for this. They talk about things like tracking windshield wiper speed and reporting that back in. Um, there's going to be more accurate weather data maps from connected vehicles, so uh, maybe we can provide value to the uh, meteorological society uh, or meteorological industry someday uh, and take advantage of that in our traffic modeling as well. These are some of the technologies that we used. Um, so a number of different tools. Again, this was a very iterative proce process, a lot of experimentation, going down different paths um, and to see what would work and then backing up and trying different techniques. So uh, two slides of, of conclusions and I'll wrap up here. Um, so um, 
In the end, for this to be accurate, uh, there was, and to, to account for all the anomalies that we saw in the speed, the speed data, uh, we needed variety of data from a variety of sources. Um, so uh, again, speed and event data only go so far. That's typically what we depend on. Uh, weather was the next big indicator, and then school being in session and other special events uh, were, the, were then the next uh, most important thing uh, after the weather. Um, data has to be cleansed. Now, this is both the historical data as well as the real-time data that comes in. We've actually seen some DOTs become a little more progressive and actually uh, run secondary processes alongside their traffic management systems that actually do data analysis in real time to detect anomalies uh, and report those at events, have the maintenance guys go out and check the detector that they just configured yesterday that doesn't seem to be reporting the data correctly anymore. Um, and, that, and I think that's going to be important for this to be an effective tool uh, for data quality to be part of our ongoing uh, processes and systems. Uh, again, so it took 30, 40 percent of our time in our research to actually just cleanse the data to make it use, usable. As far as data granularity, um, the 30 second speed data was excessive, slowed down the process um, of, of running the models, and it didn't provide any value. Um, so as far as granularity, 5 to 15 minute data was sufficient uh, for producing accuracy in the models. Uh, the algorithms in real time have to handle missing or errant data. And then uh, the, the other thing that we, that we concluded is that processing data in real time, it is possible. So the advances in computing power uh, over the last year, this is why you hear so much about deep learning, artificial intelligence, uh, things like GPUs and, and uh, multiple CPUs on the, on the same uh, uh, motherboard um, are, have made this, this uh, very, uh, uh, very possible or it wasn't five years ago. Um, we felt that traffic profiles, once you could really determine what is, what is really normal beyond day of, uh, day of week, time of day, um, it becomes a great tool for immediately identifying actual events um, that traffic operations need to, to take care of. Also, I think for reducing the number of staff that are needed in the operations center. Um, near term, we think that uh, the algorithms will uh, have to uh, be varied based upon reg uh, regions for a variety of different regions. So we talk about seasonal weather. Uh, Florida has uh, afternoon seasonal weather, but not snow and ice. Um, so we didn't look at that particularly. Uh, we think roadway geometry um, will, will have an impact. I think some of the work and discussions on simulations that, that encounter, uh, that account for geometry are probably important to factor in longer term to advance this. Uh, driver behavior is a question mark. Um, do people in one region of a country or a part of the world drive differently than others? Uh, so some of these algorithms may not be plug and play um, across different um, parts of the world. So uh, these systems will have to do a bit of learning before they uh, can actually be accurate and have value. Uh, maybe someday in the far future uh, with, well, maybe it's not that far, uh, with, with advancements in uh, taking account for road geometry and these other variables that I've mentioned, uh, maybe these, these algorithms could be plugged into a new location and within days start to be accurately predicting traffic. So thank you for, for your time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yes. Um, you mentioned in your last slide that uh, you can almost immediately identify actionable uh, uh, incidents, I think, of the wedding we use. Now, if you, if you look at a sort of a fairly high traffic road like in the system, I mean, I, I presume there must be shifting some kind of a lag. But what, in, in what kind of time frame do you think you can identify? So, so the goal is, is you can actually, we felt it was very much like real time, like you're, you're talking 30 seconds or less, you're building a, a model in real time that's keeping up with real time new, new changes and new inputs. So say if, say if the storm rolls in and rain is starting, that you could actually adapt your model in real time and under, it would understand what the expected impact would be, and then if there's a deviation from that, the idea would you have somebody look, is of course it's not going to be 100% accurate, but instead of people spending all, all of their time focused on looking at CCTV camera tours, they would just pick out the ones that the system suggests. So but real, real time. Okay? Anyway. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Let's move on with our fifth speaker, uh, Dr. Chue Charles. He's the founder of Big Data Innovation and is not only a CEO in the company, but he's also the chief designer for data mining, um, including transportation data, finance payment, mobility GPS, and 3G, 4G cellular transactions. Uh, Charles creates a lot of decision supports system via data science and earns different awards from Microsoft, MOTC, the Institute for Information Industry. Now, Charles has also been invited to central and local governments and is a special consultant of data science in Taiwan. Thank you for coming. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, today I want to share my experience with you, not only about the technical problem, also the logic problem in my experience. First of all, I want to share with my major crime in Taiwan. As you can see, the area is smaller than Melbourne, but our citizen is more than Melbourne. If you delivered with their people and the area. Maybe we can explain the pressure in the transportation is about five to six times than Melbourne. So day by day, you know, here is what happened in our city network. As you can see, the construction is not just a adjective. Day by day, it's where it happened in every seven to nine p.m. the people were coming from their, their home base and going to the work site. And in the afternoon, the, the direction will be another one, as you, you know. But today, we got new challenger in Taiwan. You know, the Pokemon Go. It's just, it's just like the time bomb. Oh, excuse me, it's just not a time. Because uh, you know what's happening in this area? The Dragon Eye is disappeared in the Beitou Park. So people want to catch the monster. They share their, their information on Twitter or Facebook. Well, in 15 minutes, this park will gather more than 4,000 people just want to catch the monster. So, well, in Taiwan, it, it's a horrible thing in, in, in this uh, transportation, but how could we solve this problem? Um, well, actually, we, we cannot reduce the, the Pokemon Go problem, but we try to use APTS to solve the day by day in the construction problem in Taiwan. So here is the problem cycle we, we want to uh, mix out. First of all, we want to know our citizens' OD trip in every time, in every place. Another one we try to figure out and create more emotions, help people to take public transit by fair rule. And then uh, we, we gather information from them and try to help our pop, uh, public transit more better than before. So we also upgrade our routing network. So. Um, here is the constituent uh, in Taiwan. You know, in a traditional, we try to make a phone call to ask our crime, where you get your original and destination, how, many, uh, how, many, how much money you pay for your daily transportation. But today, we got full service via electric pavement, just like the Mikey. Uh, E-car in uh, Australia. We got easy car in Taiwan. So no matter you take bus or the metro uh, MRT or the high speed rail, you just use the same car and you can finish all the behavior in your transportation. So here's our data set situation. In Taipei City, the bus and the MRT system is the major transaction in the daily uh, systems. So how could we transfer those data to present the each traveler's behavior in the network is our mission. But there's some problem in Taiwan, as you know. 
the fair road in bus systems, the other, the other countries were paid for the, the bus price by getting on and then get off the bus. So you will know the fully information from their original and destination. But in Taiwan, they fare by sections. So sometimes you will get their position when they get on the bus. And sometimes you will get a position when they get off the bus. So how could we find out the whole picture about their OD? We must create some methodology to mining their behavior. So we spent two years to create a modeling to solve this problem. We gather the all uh, multiple transportation as we can, including of a public bike, bus, rapid transit, and the high speed rail. We recorded everyone's data ID to identify their location and the stop. And then we combine their traffic OBU. We try to find out, we try to map in their GPS location and find out their originals and destination. Here comes our result, as you can see. People live from the major station. This is the Taipei main station. We know, we clearly know where they are going to do their destination and what time they delay arrival or departure and what kind of the car category they are, including of a normal student or some old man. You, you will use the special car category. We know about it. Here is our logic mining process. First of all, we use the transfer. If you take bus to metro uh, station, we know you do the transfer between the two kind of the vehicle station, right? So first of all, we will get your O and D. Second one is the hottest part. We will chase the each ID's behavior in the 30 days in the historical. I use the, the word trace. Yes, we, we sign our contract to protect the ID's uh, privacy, but we also find out their pattern trace. And then we will adjust the gra gravity recoveries. We will know which kind of power will have the more uh, trip. So we record in the ID's use the parent and children's concept, concept in it. Maybe the stop ID is the rapid transit station, but around the station, we will get different bus route stop, something like route one, route two, and route three. So we combine, do one more cluster to help them to gather into a parent station. So here's a, the map over here. The same color means we combine different type vehicles into one unique station. Also, we consider the people when they take work. If you transfer by work, maybe you will take 40 meter, but the other one will take 200 meter, meter. So every every consideration we need to consider about it. And then here comes up different times different station, and we also offer some keyword about which kind of station you want to query. And here's the best part, the trip chain. We offer some application to help our client draw the cycle into some specific range. You draw O and you draw D. This system will offer the trip chain for you. And the people will take one time transfer, and the, on the other group will take two times transfer. And the top bus routes combined combo will showing up on the screen. For example, we find out there's a lot of people will transfer to A to B, right? And their transfer time will be one times, two times, and three times. Here is the bus station combo. We knew the truly OD type. We knew the truly gravity distribution in the physical network. Also, 
we try to over the supply. Uh, I don't know if why I created this hyperlink. This it works, but okay, it works. Well, people can move this pinpoint any place you want. So here is a topologic map. The green one means if you leave from this point, in 30 minutes, you can take box to be arrival destination. And the blue one means the rapid transit. And the yellow one means you take the public bike, and the uh, public bike can take you to the area you want to be. So, uh, excuse me. Yeah. So it's very, it will be very interesting because uh, if you you have some problem with the house ratio, right? Uh, it's a it's a it's a very interesting demo for you. This, uh, in the left hand side, this place is just two hundred meters between the right hand side. As you can see, the public transit the public transitability is huge difference. So please buy this one before you make a decision. Well, here's my conclusion right now. Just make it simple. Well, on my right hand side, I know clearly in my transportation network how much people and what's their behavior when they do their daily transport. In my left hand side, I know the supply demand abilities uh, and when you are a decision maker, you just try to balance the right hand side, demand side, and you try to balance the left hand side, the supply side. And this is how uh, this is how I want to share with you about my experience about the transportation research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chue. That was a very interesting presentation from my point of view, and I think the challenge you had in gathering all the data sets, uh, it's just amazing. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I would like to ask something. Um, is it the data that you collect in real time? Do you have access in real time to all the trips that the citizens are doing in in the city? Yeah, uh, we need to come. We need to sign up some contract to protect the, the data. So we will gather the real time and the historical data day by day. So this yes. is how we do it. Another interesting topic that I think a lot of the people dealing with uh, data coming from citizens taking public transport is data privacy. This is a huge challenge in all of the cities and um, every country has its own regulations that they need to respect. So I assume it's the same in your case. Yeah, sure. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Let's move. <laughs> Let's move to our last uh, speaker. Mr. Lawrence Liu, uh, which has almost 30 years of experience in the planning, design, and implementation of major infrastructural and intelligent transportation system projects. He served as a principal member of the study team for the ITS master plan and ITS system architecture studies undertaken by the Ministry of Works between 2002 and 2006. He was the deputy project director for the design build integrated traffic information system for City Hall Kuala Lumpur, which was the first regional wide ITS development and ATMC and ATIS scheme for Malaysia. He has also led deployments for traffic control and surveillance system, TCSS and toll collection system on design build projects. He is presently the chairman for the technical paper committee for the upcoming ITS Malaysia seminar in February 2017 and is currently serving his fifth term as a council member of ITS Malaysia. Sorry, I was uh, distracted listening to my own biodata. 
Um, first of all, let me just start by saying that this presentation is uh, actually made on behalf of ITS Malaysia. ITS Malaysia is a member of the ITS Asia Pacific and uh, it's an association that is spearheaded by the Ministry of Works Malaysia. Uh, it comprises basically both main uh, key agencies in the public sector as well as the private sector. And it's uh, formed purely through the Ministry of Works to serve as a bridge for public-private partnerships so that we can have a dialogue and energize and mobilize the local ITS industry. So I have to say that this paper is really a collective effort of different council members from ITS Malaysia. So I, I, I will not take credit for it. And in fact, uh, uh, there was supposed to be another speaker for this. <laughs> uh, just to start off, the definition of big data in Malaysia is defined by these four V's, which you're all very familiar with already. Yeah, uh, we are talking about the volume, velocity, variety, and veracity uh, to provide value to a big and large data set. Uh, unfortunately, earlier part of this Congress, I was told that I was actually short of two additional Vs. One is visualization and the other one is variability. So perhaps in the next presentation, I'll add two more Vs to this. Yeah. Now, the, the, uh, the topics I'll talk about is basically the current situation of big data in Malaysia, the vision of our government as far as the positioning of big data industry, and uh, some of the opportunities that have been opened up recently, and we are talking only in the last couple of years, and of course, a lot of challenges ahead of the road here. Yeah? Some basic stats about the country. Uh, as Charles has uh, also shown in the slide, um, a comparison between Australia, for example. Uh, our land mass is only about 330 square kilometers uh, compared to Australia, uh, so we are about if my calculation was correct last night, about 23 times smaller in terms of land mass to Australia. We're very small, but in terms of population, we're a little bit higher than Australia. You have 24, we have about 29. So we have a lot more people packed in a much smaller space. In terms of phone use, broadband penetration, uh, internet usage, we are very high up as far as comparison with other Asia-Pacific countries are concerned. In fact, in a, in a prior study, uh, uh, Malaysians were known among all the other neighboring countries in Indonesia, Hong Kong, Singapore, China, Vietnam, even Japan. We spend more time on the internet than other countries. That could mean one of two things. We are very highly connected community or we are highly socially disconnected. I had to carry my phone up to the speaker because uh, to this podium because without the phone I feel very disconnected as well. Uh, uh, something that my wife would constantly complain at the dinner table. Phone is always in front of us. Yeah. So yes, we use internet a lot, and that gives us the key ingredient as far as big data analytics are concerned. Yeah. We have a very strong and structured national agenda as far as the framework for big data is concerned. As far as the government is concerned, they have already identified three major key strategic initiatives. One is basically talent creation. Hopefully with talent creation, there will be talent retention as well. We, we tend to be losing people to our uh, neighboring countries, which, uh, which provide probably better ecosystems for talent creation and retention. But we're trying to bring those brains back to Malaysia. The government is also trying very hard to open up data sets uh, for hackathons, for private enterprises to try to make use and innovative use of that data sets. And of course, we are trying to strike partnerships with specific identified uh, international and local companies to set up centers of excellence. I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, there are many universities which are part of the Malaysian's big data initiatives, uh, uh, many programs that are available. Yeah. Uh, as far as open data is concerned, the uh, government has basically initiated through many different government agencies the release of test data sets 
And these are openly available. Uh, as of last count, we have about 1,300 open data sets available to the public for them to try out, uh, for them to test out new innovative solutions. Uh, a lot of these are, however, unstructured. They are in PDF and Excel format. Uh, they come from ministries such as agriculture, uh, trade, uh, unfortunately, very few from the transport sector. Uh, actually, when I say very few, I actually mean no data sets, in fact, from the transport sector. Right? Having said so, uh, we have actually identified different government agencies to push through the big data initiatives. Uh, one of the things when you come to Malaysia is that most of agencies are very, uh, have, have abbreviations. You have Mampu, Mosti, uh, we've got Pemandu. Uh, so one of the few things you'll need to learn and maneuver around our regulatory processes is the understanding of these acronyms. Yeah? Now, as far as the initiatives are concerned, as I said, there are three main uh, cornerstones to it. One is talent creation yeah, through our universities, uh, through targeted industries. Uh, we are trying to open up big uh, data sets so then it can be tested, it can be verified. Um, and we are looking at basically creating through MDAC, uh, another acronym here, MDAC is our agency task for what we call multimedia development. Yeah? MDAC was formed uh, in about 20 years ago, basically to replicate what was so successful in Silicon Valley. So we're trying to establish from currently about what we think is about 4,000 data analytic professionals and moving in the next four years, escalating it by about four times that number, 16,000 data analytics yeah, professionals. Uh, as far as the Multimedia Development Corporation is concerned, it is their intent to make Malaysia the hub for big data by 2020. It's a very ambitious goal. Um, there are some benchmark milestones along the way, but you know, it's still going to be a, a, a long road ahead. Yeah? Now, as far as Internet of Things is concerned, uh, we've heard a lot about it in, in many of these uh, paper presentations. Uh, our own local national carrier, Telecom Malaysia, has already decided to roll out low uh, power wide area networks using the uh, LoRa technology or through the LoRa Alliance. Uh, we do recognize that there are other competing uh, um, low power wide area network technologies out there. Uh, but again, I'm not going to defend a decision for the use of LoRa, but at the same time, a decision has been made and we're trying to move as quickly forward as possible in embracing the IoT for Malaysia. Yeah. Um, over the last couple of years, many events, government initiated events have been created to basically uh, pull together various data professionals uh, in this industry, similar to this Congress in, itself. Yeah. So we've actually established uh, what we call uh, ASEAN Data Analytics Exchange, and this ADAX is actually located in Malaysia as a hub for ASEAN. Uh, and I believe that was also an initiative because Malaysia was the chair for ASEAN in this last uh, year or so. There's a very uh, a defined IoT roadmap from our key agencies involved in incubating and promoting big data analytics. And the two large agencies will be uh, both the Multimedia Development Corporation as well as our Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation. The four primary targeted sectors for BDA in Malaysia right now are non-ITS. They are related to more community-type social enterprises. We are looking at crime prevention, which is very high up as far as our uh, um, uh, key concerns in the country are concerned. Uh, we look at infectious disease, we look at dengue preventions, uh, look at price watch. These are all community-driven type initiatives. Uh, ITS Malaysia is trying to plug in the fifth cornerstone, which is basically transport traffic-related analytics. There are 
many opportunities for big data as far as the transport sector is concerned in Malaysia with 21 million vehicles on our roads. We have a very diverse range. We probably have the highest number of privatized highways in ASEAN, covering a total length of about 2,000 kilometers. In the next five to six years, Malaysia has committed to spending close to 45 billion ringgit or 11 billion US dollars in building that transport infrastructure. Yeah. Over the next four years, we will see the number of expressways double to about 4,000 kilometers. We have probably one of the highest number of toll highways, highest number of toll plazas. Uh, these toll plazas are a combination of both electronic as well as manual. Uh, by 2018, many of these toll plazas will disappear and be, uh, I just disappeared. Seems to be running on its own. I'm not touching anything. <laughs> Maybe because the session. Ah, okay. Time is up then. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. Um, apparently, there's uh, the announcement for the other session. Um, yeah, okay. I, I'm very Perhaps sorry. Uh, we are running a little bit late, so maybe that's why. Um, if you want to okay, maybe just wrap 30 up. Seconds, yeah. yes. So as far as infrastructure uh, investment is concerned, we are looking at 11 billion US dollars. Lots of opportunity for that. Uh, unfortunately, many challenges. Those last two slides that have gone missing are basically in relation to the challenges in Malaysia itself. We are still siloed. Multi-agencies are still keeping their data sets. Uh, we as ITS Malaysia are trying to push them to release it. And we're basically trying to uh, get that, that information out so that other innovators can actually make use of it. Uh, but it's still going to be a long struggle. The last slide that I had was really a bus crashing through uh, on our expressway, about 20 vehicles. That bus, had, that bus had about, I think, if I recall, 20 odd summonses, and the driver had about half a dozen different summonses. If we had that information available through the different agencies like police, our road transport department, that incident would not have happened. So I believe that that would be a catalyst for us to push through our big data initiatives in ITS Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to thank the audience and everyone that has attended this session. Um, unfortunately, we cannot extend anymore for further discussions. But if you are interested to speak like in person with the speakers, just please stay because now there is a break and feel free to ask them further questions or discuss uh, future partnerships or business. Thank you very much for the attention. Have a great day.